All right, continuing. This is part two of chapter 24. Uh, different kinds of speciation, allopatric speciation versus sympatric speciation. And there's a number of slides that talk about this, so I'll breeze through those later. These are pretty straightforward. Here we have a population of fish. Allopatric speciation is when a small subset or small group um, gets isolated from the parent population and they form a new species. So you might even uh, think this is tied to the founder effect, if you like. Sympatric speciation means a new uh, speciation occurs within that population where they are still in the same place. Sim means same. So a small population becomes a new species without geographic separation. So there might be some other kind of reproductive isolation that's occurring. Allopatric speciation, sympatric speciation. Um, allopatric gene flow is interrupted or reduced. Population is divided into two or more, usually geographically. This is an example of two different squirrels that live on opposite sides of the Grand Canyon. They are geographically isolated, and thus that separation will cause them to become different species. Now, if you try to get them to mate with one another, biologically, they cannot. Uh, here's a, an example of an experiment done by uh, Dodd at Yale, where she took flies and she reared some flies on starch food, starchy food, and she reared some flies on maltose food, and then she combined the two together. And what she found was that uh, the starch males and females preferred one another, and the maltose males and females preferred one another, um, but that the uh, maltose and starch uh, did not mate frequently together and vice versa. Um, they didn't like one another, so, so to speak. So this would be an example of allopatric speciation, of course. Um, polyploidy is the presence of uh, extra chromosomes due to accidents in cell division. Now, for us, for example, we might attribute this, let's say, chromosome 21 and say that causes Down syndrome. But in some organisms, polyploidy can create a new species entirely. Um, and all their descendants will be polyploid as well. Uh, such as in some plants and even some, um, some animals, such as the chinchilla, in fact. Uh, so autopolyploids are individuals that have more than two chromosome sets. They all came from a single species. So where 2n equals 6, there's some failure during meiosis. Um, and then here, in this case, 4n equals 12. Um, and gametes produced by flowers of this branch will be diploid here. And then the offspring are tetraploid again, so they have four copies of every um, chromosome. Uh, essentially, four, they are 4N, they're tetraploid. Um, and this is the adult uh, variation of that plant. An allopolyploid is different species mixing together, thus providing a different number. So I remember watching a TV show, uh, a nature episode years ago, about a monkey at the zoo in Arizona, uh, a chimp, that looked awkwardly human. Uh, and they wondered if it was the offspring of a human-chimp mating encounter um, and the, one of the ways that they determined it was they did a karyotype of one of its chromosomes um, to determine uh, how many chromosomes it had, uh, in part because uh, humans have 46 chromosomes and chimps have 44. So the offspring would have been an allopolyploid uh, if it was a combination of the two, and it, it should have had 45 chromosomes. Turns out it did not. It had 44. It was just a chimp, but it was still freakily look like a human. Um, so here's species A, species B, you see four, 2n equals 4, 2n equals 6, they combine, um, and you see an awkward number, and in the end, 2n equals 10. Uh, here's an example of mate selection, or sexual selection. You have these two different types of fish. Under normal light, when you put them in the same environment, they don't mate with each other, because visually they look different. But if you put them under monochromatic orange light, they'll mate with each other. Um, they don't realize they're a different species, and they do so freely. Um, so this is a prezygotic barrier, just morphologically or phenotypically. They look different, so they don't mate with one another. Uh, a summary of these two, we've already talked about it. Adaptive radiation is when one species uh, branches out due to new environmental conditions and evolves or changes. A typical example of this is Darwin's finches, or here we have uh, different types of plants on the islands of Hawaii. Um, very typical place where adaptive radiation occurs. All these different plants uh, are derived from the same ancestor, uh, and they exist on different islands. So genomics has actually enabled us to study and look at differences uh, molecularly or in genes, and this is going to be the, the main driving discussion or force of evolution in years to come um, in how it's studied, because now we can look at molecular differences and, uh, and study them in that way. Uh, a lot of what we know currently is from the fossil record. Uh, and we look at different episodes where new species suddenly appear, such as the most talked about one, the Cambrian explosion, where there's not a lot of species for a while, and then all of a sudden, in a certain strata or a few strata, 
uh, a giant volume or number of different species suddenly appear. Um, so uh, Eldridge and, and Gould, Stephen Jay Gould, uh, came up with the term punctuated equilibrium, an idea to explain this, where there's large, large periods of stasis or no change punctuated by very sudden change. And they say that this sudden change is caused by drastic events where this is gradualism, what we've talked about previously, slow incremental changes over time, versus punctuated equilibrium, long periods of no change and then sudden change all of a sudden uh, to some event, a fire or whatever it is, a disease outbreak. We've already talked about macroevolution. Well, it's, it occurs, this change in species, because of many thousands of small speciation episodes. Very, very small incremental changes can cause macroevolution. I suppose this favors more of the gradualism model, if you like. Um, now, most of the complex biological structures that we know of, um, we believe came from previously existing structures. So complexity is built off of things that are previously slightly less complex, such as in the eye. We can look at the eye structure of different organisms um, and look how one is a step up onto the next and so on until you get the complex human eye. Um, there's also genes that program development. So when they turn on, when they turn off to, to trigger when certain things grow, this spatial pattern of uh, an organism's form. Uh, this is called heterochrony, the rate or timing of developmental events, heterochrony. Uh, hetero means differences and crony is time. And this can affect the shape of the body, such as in this case, humans undergo allometric growth where different portions of the body uh, make it grow at different rates. Here in a baby, uh, the head takes up one third of the body, which would be really awkward if that was the case. Or sorry, one fourth, 25%. That'd be really awkward if that was the case in humans. You'd have a gigantic head. Over time, the rate of head growth slows and the rate of torso and leg growth increases. Um, so there's differential growth rates. Here you also see the same in uh, skulls where different parts of the skull grow at different rates. So chimpanzee skulls have this protrusion of the jaw, whereas a uh, human fetus, uh, a human adult does not. But you'll notice in the fetus, they look very similar. Uh, they just have different rates of growth at different times of different structures. Here you see heterochrony still uh, in salamander evolution where the ground-dwelling salamander has longer feet and little webbing. Uh, they spent more time, so to speak, a longer growth period for their digits versus the tree-dwelling salamander with shorter fingers and uh, webbing. Pedomorphosis is when you see a sexually mature species carrying uh, juvenile structures such as these external gills of this organism. Uh, I'm still waiting for someone to buy me an aquarium with these. You can actually buy these, uh, super fun. Um, I don't have one in class. Uh, but the rate of reproductive development is accelerated compared to somatic development, so some of the reproductive structures still remain in the adult. Um, homeotic genes are one type of gene um, that is tied to this uh, heterochrony, uh, where certain parts of the body grow at different times due to the homeotic gene's existence. So here you see uh, legs growing due to the homeotic genes turning on in this growth of cells, so legs grow out of that, or it extends from there. And you see the same in the zebrafish. Uh, with a fin, but they all incorporate these homeotic genes, more specifically called Hox genes. And this is actually believed to be part of the reason why, as things evolve and get more complex, they get more structures where Hox genes become duplicated. Um, and as more and more become duplicated, there's more Hox genes, more ability to turn on and off and form new structures. Um, we still use the fossil record a lot to look at changes in our environment um, due to adaptations. And we are done.